I'd just like to to start, if I if I may, by um, noting um, how much we miss the presence of John Nethercote, who um, sadly passed away earlier this year. Um, a number of you would have known him much better than I did, but um, I I know he had a great interest in some of the things I'm going to talk about today, and uh, I very much look look forward to bouncing some ideas off him, which uh, sadly is not possible. Um, but the topic, uh, my theme is um, the role of Menzies in the development of parliamentary government in Australia. Um, I propose to look at some of the key events in the middle part of his career that we're focusing on that bear on the constitutional question um, and using as a foil for those the views of H.V. Evatt, whom he faced across the chamber for many years but who was also a noted constitutional scholar. So parliamentary government is, involves having executive power in the hands of ministers who are appointed by and governed nominally in the name of the head of state, but who are responsible to the elected parliament. So it involves a balance of power between three centres, the, the head of state, the ministers, and the parliament. It's the system that evolved in England gradually over centuries and since has, has spread around the world. The head of state usually is either a hereditary monarch or a president elected directly or indirectly. Um, but in Australia, we have a different setup because the monarch is a ceremonial head of state, but our effective head of state is uh, a viceroy, uh, a nominee of the monarch, either a governor general or in the states a governor. He represents the monarch but is appointed and therefore has neither the, neither the predictability of hereditary succession uh, nor the democratic mandate of an election. So in addition to that three-way balance that I talked about, in Australia we have a sort of four-way interaction between the government, the viceroy, the monarch, and the home government, the, in our case, the government in Britain, to whom uh, the monarch normally relates. By the time Menzies and Everett were born, they were born, in fact, in the same year, 1894, um, the first of those, that three-way balance of parliamentary government, was pretty much settled. Um, there's been a bit of movement at the margins, but Fundamentally, a prime minister today, whether in Britain or in Australia, stands in the same relationship to parliament and monarch as Gladstone and Salisbury did to Queen Victoria. The second set of relationships, though, involving the Viceroy and the Home Government, um, have changed a great deal. When Federation was first established, um, Australia and other similar British possessions, which known collectively as dominions, were regarded as self-governing but not fully independent of Britain. They were part of the empire. And the imperial government, that is the British government in London, had a sort of ill-defined overall responsibility for them. And particularly for matters that concern foreign affairs and defence. And the status of the governor general reflected that. Um, he, like they were always men, of course, uh, was appointed by the monarch on the advice of the British government. And in addition to his duties under the Australian Constitution, he was the representative of the British government here. Australia didn't have diplomats of its own. Uh, as late as 1939, Menzies was still fighting a rearguard action against appointing Australian di diplomats. Um, instead, the government communicated with Britain by the Governor General. The First World War revealed some of the shortcomings of those arrangements. During the 1920s, there were discussions between Britain and the Dominions, ultimately leading to an imperial conference in 1926 and passage of the Statute of Westminster, which I'm sure you've heard of, in 1931, which redefined the imperial relationship um, in a way that was intended to ensure that the Dominions were autonomous communities within the British Empire, equal in status, 
in no way subordinate, I'm quoting from the Balfour Declaration, in no way subordinate one to another in any aspect of their domestic or external affairs, although united by a common allegiance to the Crown and freely associated as members of the British Commonwealth of Nations. Um, by that time, of course, Menzies and Everett were both significant players, so we'll break off to say something a little bit about them. Um, you've already heard a lot about Menzies today, but um, I want to pick out four things that I think are important in understanding him in this context. Um, firstly, he's a royalist. That's, that's very obvious. It persists throughout his career. Um, as Nethercote puts it, um, his faith in the crown was not simply formal and professional. It was deeply personal as well. Um, second, he's an Anglophile. Not in the sense of being un-Australian, but like many of his time, he sees, he sees no conflict between British and Australian patriotism. You, you can be both. Thirdly, um, he's a Whig, by which I mean he, um, he identifies with Parliament in the history of its struggles with the Crown. Um, Never could again, in fact, they're the opening words of his 2016 essay on the subject. By education and experience, Robert Menzies was steeped in the traditions of responsible parliamentary government, mainly as developed at Westminster. There's a, there's a lovely passage in uh, his diary when he visits England for the first time in 1935, uh, and of course he, he wants to see a whole lot of historical sites, um, but he, he sees them from the weak point of view, and it, at one point, he refers to Oliver Cromwell as the man whose sword and character made England a free country, which is the last thing that a Tory would ever say. So um, I think that's an important point to understand. The fourth point is, it might seem obvious, but um, he leads a centre-right party. So whatever his instincts on a particular issue, um, in general terms of a sort of conflict between progress and reaction, the party that he's in is the party of reaction. He might not be personally a reactionary, but they're on his side, or he's on their side. A little bit about Evert. Evert um, was a High Court judge at the age of 36. He's still the youngest ever appointed. Um, later leader of the Labour Party. The author in the 1930s, published in 1936, of the standard work on the powers of the Crown in relation to responsible government, called the King and His Dominion Governors. The Labour Party's sort of self-image, of which Everett's book is, uh, reflects, held it to be the, the, the progressive or democratic force in constitutional matters, supporting Australian independence versus the, the imperial connection. Um, but that said, Everett's book is by no means an anti-imperial tract. His main argument is that regal and vice-regal powers are poorly defined, and that the conventions that govern them should be made explicit and enforceable either by the courts or by the legislature. Um, He's conscious of the problem that if British control is excluded, then the Viceroy could have too much independence. Um, and he's also conscious of the problem of a lack of security of tenure for the Governor General, which we'll come back to a little bit later. Um, fundamentally, Evert is a rationalist. He's always looking for clarity and transparency in institutions, whereas Menzies has bit more of the conservative instinct for, for mystery, for the, the power of things unknown or unseen. Um, so, back to the 1930s. 1937, Menzies is Attorney General, and he brings in a bill to adopt the Statute of Westminster. Um, it's not preceded with, apparently due to dissension on his own side as to whether that's the right way to go. Now, by 1942, Menzies, as we know, is in opposition. War has broken out. 
Evert has left the High Court and entered Parliament and is now Attorney General and Foreign Affairs Minister in the Labour government. And he introduces a similar bill to adopt the Statute of Westminster. And again, the non-Labour side is divided. I, I won't go into this because it's, it's outside um, our time period. But um, if you get a chance, it's, it's well worth reading the debate on Statute of Westminster adoption. Um, because Menzies is sort of trapped halfway between Evert and the government's position and the more diehard imperialists in his own party. But as he explains his position, both in Parliament and in one of his radio broadcasts, he says that he, he has a problem with the Statute of Westminster because, uh, and I quote, a, it endeavoured to put into written form a relation part of whose strength rested upon its very vagueness and want of definition. It was a living spirit, and we endeavoured to imprison it within the four corners of a legal formula. And clearly, while he, he phrases it in those sort of terms about ambiguity and about, um, you know, is, is this really necessary? It's clear he also objects to the whole idea that the crown can be divisible. The idea that the, the crown in right Australia actually has a different legal personality from the crown in right of the United Kingdom. But as he also sort of acknowledges, the boat's already sailed on that one. The Imperial Conference of 1926 has decided that, and Australia has to live with it. So the bill is passed, uh, the war is won, uh, Menzies returns as, as leader of the opposition, um, and in, 1950, in 1946, um, Chifley has to choose a new governor general. And his choice, uh, it, it's always been Labour policy, but the governor general should be Australian. Um, Chifley chooses William McKell, who at the time was the Labour Premier of New South Wales. Um, Menzies Menzies attacks that uh, in, in very strong very strong terms. He says, Labour has chosen to force upon his majesty by depriving him of any other choice, one who in the nature of things will be regarded by Australians generally not as a representative of the king, but as a representative of the present prime minister. Uh, he implicitly threatened to have McKell sacked if the Liberals won the next election. Um, and he quotes Evert in support of this. Um, Evert, of course, thinks it's a good thing that uh, an Australian should be appointed on the advice of Australian ministers. But in the King and his Dominion governors, he had expressed concern that if the monarch has no discretion in the matter, then incoming governments will find it convenient to have the current viceroy dismissed and replaced by their own nominee. And therefore, I quote, uh, the Office of Governor-General will become a mere reflection of the existing Dominion administration and consequently no exercise of any reserve power will take place. And Menzies echoes that, saying that with every change of government, the appointment of the Governor-General would be terminated and some other politician put in his place. Um, Evert declined to rise to the debate in, in Parliament at the, at the time. He spoke in the debate but didn't talk about the Governor-General. Um, and in the end, the, the McKell episode does show Menzies in, in a better light because having, having made his political point, once McKell was in office, he was courteous and correct to him, uh, in contrast to some liberal MPs, uh, and they worked together well. Um, A.W. Martin, uh, Menzies' biographer, says that in due course, Menzies came to follow this elementary courtesy with genuine respect for McKell's dignity and complete impartiality. Then, 1949, as you all know, Menzies returned to power. Um, I want to look at four episodes from that period in power, although we'll have time for only briefly considering the last two. Uh, I know Georgina was watching me with the, the clock. Um, firstly, the double dissolution of 1951. The Chifley government in its last term had reformed the Senate voting system, producing the more evenly balanced Senate that uh, Senate results that we're used to. That meant that Labor retained a substantial Senate majority after the 1949 election. 
and that majority proceeded to give Menzies some trouble with his government's legislation, although it did so cautiously because it was reluctant to give him an excuse for a double dissolution. Uh, for that reason, it eventually allowed, uh, allowed through the legislation to dissolve the Communist Party, which was um, later struck down by the High Court. Um, but in the case of another bill, the Commonwealth Bank Bill, 1950, the Senate uh, first passed the amendments that were unacceptable to the government, and then when it was presented a second time, after the three-month interval, delayed debate on it for some weeks, then referred it to a select committee. Menzies formed the view that this amounted to a failure to pass within the meaning of Section 57, and asked Governor General McKell to approve a double dissolution. And this is the classic case of where the Viceroy is often said to have an independent discretion as to whether to accept such a, a request. And Menzies' admirers have often pointed out that he recognised this and that and did not try to coerce McKell. Um, but if you look at the actual advice that uh, Menzies eventually tabled some years later in Parliament, that discretion is somewhat illusory. Yes, he told McKell that he had to make up his own mind on the question of whether the legal requirements of Section 57 had been met, that is, whether the Senate had failed to pass the bill. Um, but that was the only discretion he admitted. Um, he gave no hint of a suggestion that once McKell was satisfied that the legal requirements for the double dissolution had been made out, he had any right to form his own judgment about whether it was a good idea or not. And McKell, despite his Labour background, accepted Menzies' advice. So although Labour was understandably unhappy with that double dissolution, which went on to cost it control of the Senate, Menzies' practice, in fact, was completely consistent with the lessons that Everett had drawn in his book from his analysis of the only previous double dissolution in 1914, um, of which the key one was that so long as the conditions mentioned in Section 57 are with, the Governor-General will grant a double dissolution to ministers who possess the confidence of the House of Representatives. Um, John Howard, who is by no means unsympathetic to Menzies, um, says that McKell was sworn to observe the conventions of his office, which required him to take the advice of his Prime Minister unless it were manifestly wrong, which in this case it clearly was not. Um, no, don't. Oh, oh dear. Okay. Um, the second noteworthy occasion was the following year with the selection of McKell's replacement as Governor General. Um, Menzies had repented of his personal hostility. That didn't stop him reverting to the practice of making a British appointment rather than an Australian one. Um, he went to Britain in 1942 when Queen Elizabeth was very new to the throne. Um, and there's something, there's something, again, something rather Whiggish in his sort of patronising attitude to the Queen. Um, but their discussions related to the appointment of another Englishman, William Slim, uh, who was a hero of the Second World War. And uh, John Howard comments that that was where the practice of appointing British citizens to post should have ended. But Menzies would do it twice more. And indeed he did. Lord Dunrossell in 1960, and after he died in office, Viscount Delisle in 1961. There's the same deference to Britain as, as, uh, as Nethercote put it. Um, they all met a criterion that Menzies considered essential for the appointment. The Queen knew them. Um, Menzies did eventually accept the need for an Australian with the appointment of Lord Casey, his former foreign minister, in 1965. Um, he stuck to his, his guns on the idea that no serving politician should be uh, appointed, and he criticised, albeit privately, the appointment of Paul Haslock in 1969 on that basis, uh, although whether he could cared more about the principle itself or the need to preserve his own consistency is impossible to say. Um, I could talk about a couple of other things. There's the Royal Powers Bill of 1953 where, um, again, Menzies and Everett face off in, in the House, but um, the constitutional argument has clearly died down. It's a very calm debate, and no one else even bothers to speak on it. Um, and also, the early election of 1955, Menzies has um, come very close to defeat in 1954, so he's working with a 
narrow majority. Um, he goes to Governor, Governor General Slim and asks for an early election. Again, no suggestion that Slim has any discretion in the matter. Um, Slim followed his advice, as has every Governor General since. Um, what lessons can we draw from all of this? I want to mention four very quickly. First, politics is hard. Okay? Time and again, politicians, especially when they're in government, find themselves having to say and do things that don't sit very well with the doctrines they've espoused in the past. That's politics. Second, as some other speakers have suggested, Menzies is both more complex and more interesting than you might think from the, the caricatured version of him that's often presented from either supporters or opponents. Um, thirdly, Australian constitutionalism has an importance that goes beyond this country. Together with the other dominions, Australia showed in both federal and state experience that parliamentary government could develop peacefully and work effectively even without a hereditary monarch or an elected head of state. And finally, the problem that Evett pointed out of the insecurity of tenure of the Viceroy is still with us. It was an underlying presence in the crisis in 1975 when John Kerr felt that he needed to act quickly and secretly for fear that otherwise he would be dismissed. The worst fears haven't been realised. Incoming governments have never thought it necessary to wipe the slate clean. And the fact that we managed to live with such problems can be put down to the fact that most of the time, our political class have shared a commitment to playing by the rules and also a broad agreement on what those rules are. And for that, I suggest both Menzies and Everett deserve a share of the credit. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. That was fascinating. Uh, and, um, and you did rightly acknowledge John Nethercote, who passed away earlier this year. and. Um, he was due to give a presentation at this conference, so sad, very, very sadly missed, but it's wonderful that you've been able to make a contribution on, on these issues, which I know he felt very strongly about too. I'm sure not as good as he did. No. But we do our best. <laughs> uh, David, thank you very much. First question. David Lee, UNSW. Thank you very much for the talk. Could you comment on two international relations-related constitutional issues? One when India becomes a republic and wishes to remain part of the Commonwealth, and secondly, the British intervention in the Suez Canal and the controversy that engendered between Menzies and Ebbing. Okay. Um, yes, the, the, the first thing you, you've got to understand is there's, there's, there's sort of the old Commonwealth and the new Commonwealth. So... The old Commonwealth is effectively the white Commonwealth. You know, it, it's Australia, Canada, New Zealand, South Africa. It's the, the dominions that, that were already there before the Second World War, so many of these grew up in. Um, after the Second World War, all these countries start, other countries start becoming independent um, in, in Africa and Asia, of which India is the first big one, by far the biggest. And they have a different sort of relationship with Britain. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not English in the same way that Australia is, certainly Australia was. So they don't have that sort of visceral loyalty to the crown. And so India becomes a republic. But it still wants to be, it still wants to be in the Commonwealth. And Menzies is deeply uneasy about this. Menzies has the view that... Um, the whole point of the Commonwealth is the loyalty of the crown. And that's so, so that he, he eventually accepts it, and, and he, he, he does go on to develop quite good relationships with some of the leaders of the new Commonwealth countries, but he has trouble with this idea that you can be a republic but, but, but still in the Commonwealth. Um, but that debate is had, and it, it, it goes against him. India's accepted. Um, and ironically, the fact that South Africa later becomes a republic 
is used by the rest of the Commonwealth as an excuse to get rid of them, because by that time apartheid is, is a matter of great controversy. Uh, and Menzies is uncovered with that as well. Um, Suez, I don't claim to be any sort of an expert on. But again, Menzies, Menzies sees the Commonwealth in, in these perhaps sort of romantic terms of the pre-war era, where the British Empire at least made some effort to sort of speak with one voice in international relations. And so Menzies feels the obligation to go along to, he, he doesn't, it's not so much all the way with Britain, but he, he wants to be a peacemaker. He wants the Commonwealth and, and through the Commonwealth himself to play a role in Suez that it probably just isn't really suited for them. Uh, and eventually the Americans just cut the ground out from under him completely uh, and say, no, you, you, Britain and France are going to have to back down. And, and, and Menzies is left sort of out on the end. It's, it's, it's a bit of an embarrassment. But um, it, it suggests that his idea of the Commonwealth just hadn't kept pace with the, 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 the new reality. understand you to to say that uh, until the statute of Westminster the governor general was appointed on the advice of the, the British Prime Minister yes uh, well well at least until it, it's not absolutely clear when that changed but at least until the first world war uh -huh. that was the case um, as far as I can tell these in the early days the Australian government wasn't even consulted. On, on, on the question. Um, it, it changes during the 1920s. Um, so it's not, it's not so much the statute of Westminster itself, but it's the decisions of the various imperial conferences that led to that, lead to a change in practice. Uh, and Scullin, in 1931, is the first prime minister who actually insists on his choice of governor general and 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 ba basically go, go goes to england and sort of tells george v to his face that you know you've got to appoint isaac isaacs who was a very distinguished judge uh i want him as governor general no you don't get a choice but but prior to that yes the british government was was uh sorry it's, well, without it's wanting to prolong the point what about in the states when did it change in the st in the states <laughs> um You'll love the answer that legally in the States it didn't change until 1986 with the Australia Acts. Uh, in, in practice, of course, it had changed before then, but, but legally the British government retained a role in relation to advising. I mean, I resisted the temptation to talk about the States because there's, there's too much material anyway, but the, the States weren't part of the Statute of Westminster, so they, whereas the Canadian provinces were, but um, so the states continued to deal with the British, deal with the crown via the British government right up until the 1980s, which is yes. deeply strange. <laughs> I just want to comment on the matter of the governor general. Um, and being appointed, it goes back to the foundation of our constitution. And at the time, there was two dissenting voices. And they both had a shaping of that, of that first constitution. They were Sir William ha um, Harrison Moore and Anglis Clark. And if you want the technical details, you'll find them in one of the proceedings. I can look them up for you if you want, of the Samuel Griffith Society. And they maintained that we didn't need the approval of the Crown and it was proven when Hawke introduced the Australia Act and the law lord sent it back and said, you already have the right to appoint your own Governor General irrespective of the Imperial Act. And it was a real politic of the day that was pushing this, that we thought we would be protected by the British Navy. I don't want to take up any more time. The strategic argument to there and lots of fears going on. That, 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 that's right. It's It's... It's very much about the defense and foreign policy sort of relationship. 
uh, the, the, you know, Britain was the world superpower at, at, at the time. So the protection of the British Navy, was, that, that was a big thing. Um, but, yeah, the, 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 exactly what it means to be an independent country in, in, that, in that context is, is a, really interesting, uh, a really interesting question. And um, the, the question of what, what powers does the Governor General have other than what's in the Constitution? I mean, on, on, on one view, well, no, there's no, such, there's no such thing as a royal prerogative in Australia because it's, it's, it's a constitutional office. It, it's, the Governor General only has the powers that the Constitution gives them. But, yeah, there are other views as well. The, the, I, I, I personally don't like that term, but 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 yes, that's um, they're commonly called reserve powers. But even again, that that's sometimes used for what are clearly statutory powers or constitutional powers. It's just that normally they're exercised on the advice of a prime minister. But that there's a sort of a reserve power to exercise them independently. Yeah, I was just wondering about the effect of the 1914 double dissolution and how badly that sort of backfired as far as both did it create any hesitancy in Menzies' decision to go to a double dissolution and did it help establish the precedent that it wasn't a big deal for the, the Governor General to grant a double dissolution because there was always that um, potential latent in the Australian people to sort of punish the government for taking one. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely 1914 is in Menzies' mind at the time. Um, so, and, and he's not, I, I think it's fair to say Menzies is not naturally a big risk taker. You know, he, he, he's got a fairly conservative temperament that way. So, um, he's not going to have a double dissolution unless he's really confident he can win. And, and, with, with the communist bill, you see, he thinks he's got a, 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 a popular sort of winner. Um, but the other thing, the other thing about 1914, it also because because the government loses, then uh, Fisher wins the election, comes to power, and what he does is he immediately releases all the correspondence with the governor general about granting the double dissolution. That's all tabled in Parliament. So there's that precedent set for the idea that the advice should be be open and and. And Menzies, he doesn't table it immediately. He waits a few years until after McKell's retired, but he does um, He does the same. So, so all those documents, they're now all online. You can go and read them yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>